Good morning, this is Billy Robinson with the Prairie Plains Church of Christ, and I want to welcome you to our study today for November the 21st of 2021. There was a man who had a boat and two oars, and on the two oars he gave them a name. The first one was named Faith, the other one was named Works. Someone asked him the reason why, and he demonstrated it to me. He took one paddle by the name of Faith, got in the boat, got into the lake, and started rowing. And as you know, all he did was just go around in a circle. He, excuse me, finally got back to shore, and then he took, let's try the oar named Works. He got back in the boat started using the oar and just as when he used the oar faith by itself the boat didn't make any progress it just went around in a circle it couldn't get where he was wanting to go so he finally got back to the shore and he made this statement which is a very applicable statement as we study about faith and works he said, you see, to make a passage across the lake, one needs both oars working simultaneously in order to keep the boat in a straight and narrow way. Think about that statement. They've got to work hand in hand together, not separately, not on their own, but together. He doesn't make any progress, doesn't get to the destination where he's headed if he doesn't use both of them. And it's the same way in our Christian lives today. Today, we are going to be studying. studying about faith, a gift versus a work from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 is going to be the basis for our study. Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's take a minute and focus on the word obtained. What have we obtained? We have obtained a like precious faith. Peter is writing to the recipients of his letter, and he says that they have a like precious faith with one another. So he's comparing the faith of his recipients to the faith that he has, to the faith of the other apostles. And we also can have a like precious faith, just as Peter did, just as the apostles did, just as the recipients of this letter did. He does not put his spirituality above the spirituality of the other apostles. He does not put himself above those to whom he's writing. He wrote to these Christians and said that their faith was just as precious as his was. That statement gives me hope. That statement gives me encouragement in my life. Peter is the one who saw Jesus perform miracles. He heard him teach. He watched him. Uh, death, his burial, his resurrection. He, he saw him after he was raised from the dead. And so you're telling me that my faith can be a precious faith, faith just like Peter's? Absolutely. That's what Peter, who's inspired by the Holy Spirit, is telling me. If you go back to John chapter 20, verses 18 through 20, Jesus told Thomas that scripture was written so people who had not seen him could have faith, that they could believe and have life in his name. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when she had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. 
then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Can you imagine the excitement of these disciples? But one wasn't there. The one that wasn't there wasn't able to join in on the happiness of the Lord's resurrection. Being raised from the dead, being raised from the grave, and being alive again. And that was Thomas. And although they tried to convince Thomas, he would not take their testimony. Even though it was eyewitness testimony. In John 20, verse 24 and 25, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now think about this. Thomas had the testimony of the others. He had their eyewitness testimony, but that wasn't enough for him. He wanted more. Beginning in verse 26. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Excuse me. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus' response is very important here because he mentions two groups of people, those who see and believe. And the second group, those who never see and believe. If you think about the disciples, eyewitnesses of his life, his teachings, uh, there was the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, the things that they saw about Jesus, the, the, the resurrected Lord's teachings after his resurrection, they saw his ascension in heaven. There's just things that are right on top of one another here. But what about the majority of the people who became disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, who became Christians, who never saw the Lord? And that would even include us today. Doesn't this mean that faith isn't based on evidence? Blessed are they that have not seen, yet have believed. No, it is not. We have a different kind of evidence than they had. We don't get to physically see and touch the wounds of the resurrected Lord. But we do have the eyewitness testimony of those who did. And that's what we need to realize. In John 20, verses 30 through 31. He says, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Do you see it? This text is not against evidence for faith. In fact, this text is part of the evidence for faith that we read about Thomas. There are those who see the evidence and believe, and there are those who read the evidence and believe. But make no mistake about it. Both rest on the firm foundation of evidence that Jesus did live. He was crucified. He was buried. He was resurrected. He did ascend into heaven. Biblical faith is based on evidence. And that's what the story of Doubting Thomas is all about. I'm reminded of 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show you that eternal life, 
which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Although no one alive has seen Jesus, a person can read the testimony of men who were with Jesus, and they can read of historians that wrote about Jesus. And as a result, one's faith can be just as strong and precious as Peter's was because of the testimony that we have in the Word of God. We have a like precious faith as Peter, as Paul, as John, and Matthew, and Thomas, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and the list just goes on and on. Now I want to focus on the word obtained again. It is in the aorist tense, which means it is an action that took place in the past. In the past, they had obtained, they had received a like precious faith with Peter and the others. A like precious faith has Peter, which he had obtained in the past. Peter says their like precious faith has been obtained. The word obtained means to obtain by lot, to receive by divine allotment, obtain, to cast lots, determine by lot. The Derby, the NAS, the NIV, the NJB, the NRS translations has the words who have received a like precious faith. The NLT says to all of you who, spare, who share the same precious faith we have, faith given to us by Jesus Christ. Woost says to those who've been divinely allotted like precious faith. Since this word comes from the word meaning casting lots, we need to look at the Bible and determine why people did cast lots. On one hand, casting lots was something a chance. Uh, people wanted to find out an answer or make a decision apart from their own efforts. It's, it's like a, a gambling, uh, a game of chance, you could say. On the other hand, as we look at God's word, Casting lots was one way people received an answer from God. God would reveal his will to them. The practice of casting lots occurs most often in connection with the division of the land under Joshua. In Joshua chapters 14 through 21, God allotted the Israelites to cast lots in order to determine his will for a given situation. As we can see in Joshua 18 and 1 Chronicles 24, various offices and functions in the temple were also determined by lot. The sailors on jo Jonah's ship also cast lots to determine who had brought God's wrath upon their ship. The 11 apostles cast lots to determine who would replace Judas. Casting lots eventually became a game people played and made wagers on. And this is seen uh, in, in, with the Roman soldiers casting lots for Jesus' garments. So it seems that Peter is saying that he, along with the apostles and the recipients of this letter, had obtained a like precious faith, which was not attained as the result of any personal merit or any personal self-righteousness or, or a bootstrap method or any self-effort from that standpoint. It was allotted to them as a free gift. So what is Peter saying? The faith they had, the faith we have, is a gift from God, is the way that Peter is putting it here in this particular verse. Verse. Now, he is not contradicting Jesus. He's not contradicting Paul. He's not contradicting James. In fact, in John chapter 6, verse 28-29, Jesus was asked a question, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. This tells me that some of the ones that were present were not being hypocritical with Jesus. 
They were really searching. They were really wanting to know some answers to some spiritual needs. They needed to, they wanted to know what they needed to do uh, to do the labor for the meat that endures forever that Jesus just taught. Jesus simply says that it is the work of God for them to believe on Jesus Christ, whom he had sent. Jesus joined faith and work here in the same breath, but not a work of merit. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, the gift there is referring to the salvation that they had received through faith that was not of their selves. Lumos verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Just as Jesus mixed faith and works together, Paul puts faith and works together here, not as merit, not as something that we earn. Salvation a gift is absolutely correct. But it is through faith we obtain this gift of God. And that's absolutely correct. The works Paul condemns is the works that merit salvation. Works where one tries to earn salvation. And that is what he is dealing with. A work is something we must do to obtain salvation. Is the way that Jesus put it is the way that Peter puts it, is the way that James puts it. And so with not to earn salvation, but it is something that is required of us. Notice Acts 2 verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said there is something that we need to do to save ourselves. What did he just say in Acts 2, verse 38? He said to repent. Didn't Jesus tell us that we needed to repent? Absolutely. But before we can repent, we've got to have faith. We've got to believe. Absolutely. Unless you believe that I am me, you shall die in your sins. He says, unless we repent, we shall perish, Luke 13, 3. But notice what else Peter said in Acts 2.30, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. So saving ourselves means that we need to do something. And in the context of Acts 2, it means that we need to believe. It means that we need to repent. And it means that we need to be baptized into Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 9, listen to what Paul wrote to Timothy. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Now he's talking about our works of merit. Not according to our works. Our works is not going to save us. In fact, after we've done all that we're supposed to do, still say that we're unprofitable servants is what Jesus stated. What works of ours is perfect? <laughs> Good question, isn't it? None of mine. None of yours. It says, but according to his own purpose and grace, he saved us, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, I want you to think about something for a minute, and I want you to put in your mind, and I want you to mull over in your mind. And this is something that I've, I've, I've come up with and I thought about as we were studying this particular text. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, I have a question. What creates faith from this verse? He tells us, doesn't it? The Word of God. That's what creates faith. My question next is, who gave the Word? Well, if we go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. It originated from the mind of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 
Now I want to grasp this, what I am about ready to share with you to help us maybe to understand a little bit more about what Peter is saying. If faith comes by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, and God gave the word, the scriptures, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, my question is this, who gave faith? Well, to me, it's very obvious that we conclude that faith was given by God. He gave us the information that we can read and have faith. I've always been taught faith is a work. But how can this be? This is very important because there are many who claim that works are not necessary for salvation. They support that by saying works don't save us. Well, we do know that meritorious works, according to Ephesians 2, does not save us. That is absolutely correct. But now I want you to notice Jesus put faith and works together. And that's important. Paul put faith and works together. That's important. But he did, they did not put meritorious works and faith together. That's what's important. That's what we need to understand. Look at James chapter 2, verse 17, and see how he puts faith and works together. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. You claim you have faith and you don't have works. Your faith is dead, is what James said. He said, Billy, if I don't go out here, and work in the kingdom, produce the fruit of the Spirit, or, or grow in the graces and in the virtues that Peter talks about in chapter 1 of Second Peter, my faith is dead. Look at verse 20. But what thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. How many times? Does an inspired writer of God have to mention something before we believe it? He mentions it twice within four verses here. Faith without works is dead. Now, he's not talking about earning our way to heaven. We cannot earn our way to heaven, for, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. But now I do want you to notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Our faith is to be at work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Did Paul not state in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works. We can't have faith without works whatsoever. So let's go back to 2 Peter 1. We have obtained a like precious faith. God provided a gift of faith by providing the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, being born in a manger. He fulfilled all the prophecies in his flesh. He didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. He lived a sinless life here on earth, performed many miracles that proved that he was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. God has provided us information that he died on the cross, that he was buried, he was resurrected three days later. And that was confirmed in scripture, confirmed by historians. It is also states in Romans 1, 4, that he's declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. 
And what does all this do? It creates faith in us. We read this from Scripture. God provided the empty tomb, the resurrection that we read about in Scripture. We read about the 40 days that he spent between his resurrection and his ascension to the heaven, teaching the apostles things concerning the kingdom of God, as we see in Acts chapter 1. And we have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Why do we have all this information? Why has God been so gracious to us to give us this so that we can possess faith? Oh, we've got to cooperate with God, absolutely. We've got to cooperate with him and, and read and study so that faith can be produced in us. God gave us all of this information so we can believe. If we did not have what God gave us as a result of his grace and mercy, none of us could have faith. Have you ever thought about that? How could we have faith without the word of God? And he stated, we have obtained this like precious gift of faith that God has given us, that we have received out of his grace. He didn't have to, but he wants all men to come to faith. He wants all men to come to repentance. He wants all men to come unto Jesus, to obey his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Unless we obey that, we will be lost in an eternal fire, separated from God for eternity. Second Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 10. For this is the only power of God to save us. And we can have faith that Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected because of the scriptures that God has given us. So how do we obey the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? It is in baptism. We are crucified with him and we're baptized into his death in baptism we're buried with him in baptism and we're raised with him from that watery grave of baptism as a new creature as a new creation as a new man why because we've been born again we've been loosed from our sins by the blood of jesus christ isn't God good. He's provided a means for us to have faith today. And that faith is just as precious as the faith of Peter and Mary and Lazarus and all the others and Thomas and the recipients to whom he was writing. I ask you today, do we have the kind of faith that a step out and do what God has asked us to do to become a child of his? Have you obeyed the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus? You know, when we come up out of that water grave of baptism, he says that we walk in a new life. We're to be faithful, living for Jesus. Working for Jesus created unto good works is what Paul stated in Ephesians 2.10. For you see, if I, we don't have works, our faith is dead, James 2. Let's grow as we study Second Peter together in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing me to share this lesson with you today.